And of course, as everybody knows, I'm Bir Krishna Goswami. And today we're having an interview with Dr. Radha Radya. And he's a famous German doctor, Dr. Jakob. And he's in charge of, I guess, one of the largest German health products firms. And uh, quite expert in many different areas, of course, in infectious diseases and cancer, and especially prevention. He's expert in, and he's been advising me for a number of years, and that's uh, why I've lived to the ripe old age of 101 right now, by his... He looks still so young. <laughs> you know, he's, I can't say that he's discovered the fountain of youth, but... He's really helped me tremendously, and he uh, usually nags me about my health. And I do take his advice, usually. I do take his advice and uh, structure my life, and I'm feeling a lot better now than I've felt in a long time. And so today we're talking about uh, COVID-19, and specifically prevention, and see what else he wants to talk about. But. Right now, I'd like to ask him a few questions about what can we do, first of all, to prevent getting the disease, number one, and after that, we're going to ask him the question about what can we do to enhance our immune system. I guess these two things are pretty much connected. So, doctor, would you like to speak a little bit about these subject matters? Yeah. Um, um. I put it in a little broader context because what I can observe worldwide now is on the one side really um, a lot of paranoia and fear, uh, which is unfounded. On, on the other hand, uh, stupid carelessness, which is behind the real the pandemic. So uh, what we are talking about is a reasonable middle way because uh, COVID-19 is going to return as COVID-20 and maybe as 21. It's going to stick around. Uh, it's going to go away now in the summer and it will come back a lot stronger in autumn and winter. So the point is, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. Hmm. And um, the problem we are facing now basically is a complete failure of our Western countries, a, a mixture of arrogance and ignorance. Because if you look at Asian countries, they contained the disease very quickly. Taiwan has seven deaths mm. in 24 million people. They were amongst the first hit by the disease. South Korea has few more, but same, uh, South Korea has not even 300 deaths, Japan under 1,000. So uh, China below 5,000. What we can see is we have been doing a lot of things really wrong in the Western countries. And these Asian countries have been doing things really right. And it's good to look there and, and to learn. So the first point is it's not a deadly disease, really. It's not a killer virus. Actually, it's a pretty harmless virus compared to the previous coronavirus epidemics like SARS and MARS. There we had really 30% of the people dying. Now we see high numbers, but the reason for the high numbers is that the disease is very, very contagious. So you can get infected really easily. And hand washing really doesn't help because it's an airborne disease. So you get infected by the air, uh, specifically by the breathing air. So if you're in a closed room, temple room, and you have enthusiastic devotees singing Hare Krishna, you have a super spreading event if only one is infected. We can see from uh, church choirs that one person infected like 50 to 100 other persons within one hour. That's really a pattern you see again and again. Whilst if you're outside uh, in the open and you have distance, there's no risk because the wind blows away the aerosols which carry the virus. So in the summer outside, if you make bhajans and some, 
and you have distance, there will be really little risk. Now you can wear some masks in addition. But what you definitely have to be aware of, it's coming back in November and December and January, February, even more. And that's definitely not a good time to you know, plan a Kirtan Mela or stuff like that, because these are going to be super spreading events. So again, um, if you just have young people there, probably nobody will die. They will just get sick. You know, like after every Kirtan Mela, practically everybody who comes back has a cold. <laughs> I know. <laughs> So um, the problem is if you don't have a good immune system, if you have uh, other diseases like hypertension, diabetes, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary problems, and especially if you're older, your risk for a, a, a bad or deadly outcome really shoots up very high. That's why uh, what people don't understand right now is the death numbers, uh, the mortality rates are wrong. In reality, if you look at good studies from China and the Netherlands, 10 to 40 times more people are actually infected or have been infected. So if, if you read these numbers of infections, actually they are higher by 10 or 40 times. That means your mortality rate is also divided by 10 to 40. That means it's in the area of the flu or even lower. Mm. So it's not very deadly, but it's very contagious and you need common sense to avoid it. Um, in America, you probably have the same stupid propaganda that these masks are useless. We, yeah. we had that in Germany for the official scientists were telling for two months, you know, it's useless, you know, it doesn't bring anything, don't use it, the doctors need it, we don't have enough. I mean, an amount of scientific garbage I've never encountered. Um, the Taiwanese government in the beginning of February had the military make masks. They didn't have any lockdown, but they provided their 24 million people surgical masks and you see the outcome. Nobody, almost nobody died. No lockdown, just reasonable action with a perfect outcome, same in South Korea. So um, this is the number one thing really. If you're in a closed room really uh, where you're closer to people, wear these things, you're protecting yourself and others, um, especially if somebody is like really having a, a moist pronunciation like in, in Spanish or some people in English, you know, it gets stuck here, you don't spread it around. Obviously, the louder you speak, the more these aerosols blow into the room. And if you sneeze, you can reach somebody five meters away. I so, think German, that German is actually more dangerous. Now, um, in Germany, you go, ah, like that. <laughs> yeah, no, that's uh, Spanish are worse than the Italians because they're louder usually. <laughs> but uh, yeah, <laughs> Swedish have less problems. So one important thing, you know, these masks, the Darth Vader mask, it's useless. It protects you, but it doesn't protect at all the others because this ventil lets everything out. So this is a completely egoistic mask. <laughs> <laughs> you need one without that kind of filter. You have the right one there. I think that's a, and if an FFP95 mask, yeah. Stephen Reynolds has, yeah, that's a good one. That <laughs> protects both sides. Problem is in, in Kirtan, you may not get enough air. <laughs> so you may, <laughs> that's the problem. You may have to find a, a Kirtan, a Bajan kind of mask if you do it outside. And I think outside, if you have like two meters distance, there won't be a problem. So we have one thing, it's the aerosols, closed rooms, and uh, in the winter also uh, the moisture, moist polluted air is very risky. We had that a lot in Spain, in Italy and in Wuhan. You had a lot of coiled foggy air. Therefore India next winter will be very risky too. Then people will get sick. Right now it's just complete paranoia. They will get sick really in uh, January, February, December. Then you have this foggy 
polluted air. So the other aspect uh, is obviously the, the virus load. Healthy people can get sick if they get a full load of the virus. So if I sneeze at somebody uh, right in the face and he inhales and it goes right to the lung, even a healthy person can get pretty sick because then the body doesn't have the time to build up immunity. It's like a full on attack. And that explains those deaths of you know, doctors and nurses who were relatively young uh, and healthy and died anyway. So remember to reduce virus exposure. And it's not, you know, if you touch something and you get a few thousand viruses, that's not the load I meant. It's really, you get a full breathing load that goes down to your lung, your lung gets infected, then you're in, um, in troubles that you should avoid. Um, people with preliminary diseases, of course, have to be a lot more careful than others. Actually, they are the ones who should get isolated, not, not the kids, obviously. They have almost no risk. So if you have these preliminary diseases, be careful. And obviously, there's a lot you can do next to reduce exposure to uh, improve your uh, immunity to um, uh, have a, a much milder cause of the event because what we can learn from these studies is 80% of the infected, 80% have no symptoms almost at all. No fever, nothing. They feel normal but are infected. This is also the problem why the virus could spread so well. You know, it's the healthy people that spread it, obviously not the ones lying in the hospital. They don't spread anymore. Um, out of the 20%, again, 95% have a mild kind of cold flu-like disease. And then 5% have that critical thing that can end up uh, in, a, in a deadly way. So to prevent this is really about uh, improving your general health and your immunity. Very good. Uh, can you mention something about uh, what you eat and how the diet affects your ability to deal with this disease? Um, for, for devotees, diet is important, but I would like to start with a very simple point because I, I heard somebody who got infected and made a really very stupid suggestion um, that you got really sick if you sleep. Sleeping is the most important element for a good immune system because your body regenerates in sleep and your immune system builds up in sleep. And six hours in our lifestyle is not enough for most people. So get enough sleep, which means around eight hours. And if you feel sickly, take, take even more. Uh, you may need it. Often we feel tired and bad because we have some virus infection we are fighting. If I have a virus, I feel it immediately here and I feel my uh, vitality and everything goes down, I need extra rest. So listen to your body and uh, rest up, recover. That's the first thing. Diet-wise, um, our cheese and dairy product uh, diet is not really helpful for, uh, for a lot of reasons. It's important to have a, a lot of uh, vegetables, especially fruits, cereal, you know, healthy stuff in your diet. Uh, replace dairy with legumes, pulses, chickpeas and uh, dal and so on. Um, you, you can see on the microscope immediately people who lead a, um, a lot of uh, dairy products, especially cheese, paneer, their blood, their thrombocytes start to coagulate immediately after you take a blood drop. Their coagulation is a lot increased compared to somebody who's like on a more plant-based diet. Um, that's connected with the fibrin buildup. There's a, you know, a whole explanation with the coagulation cascade. But the point is, um, you will find devotees who got really sick usually are obese, hypertonic, and on a diet with a lot of milk products. So, 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 can you be more specific about that? That you say that eating milk, or of course, devotees don't take meat, but any sort of animal products cause the blood to uh, coagulate 
much more easily or clot much more easily. Yeah. How is that connected with COVID-19? So the, um, I mean, the, the factors in the milk is it's very high in lysine that makes fibrin and it's very high in calcium that's essential in the coagulation cascade. So that's the biochemistry and you can see it in the microscope very easily. So uh, with COVID-19, what, uh, what happens to people is they get infected. If it stays here, I mean, in the nose, in the mouth, it's easy peasy. They hardly feel it. it's like a cold. If it goes down to the lung, no, then it gets really risky. If it infects the lung, then you have that critical disease. And uh, this happens if people have an unbalanced immune system, that means that their specific immunity doesn't kick in, they cannot really fight the virus, but instead they overreact with the unspecific immunity. They have a so-called cytokine storm that is like a heavy inflammation that affects the lung and everything. And that cytokine storm is already a major trigger for blood coagulation. There's another major trigger in blood coagulation, which is uh, the breathlessness that comes next. If your oxygen, if your oxygen, if you know, if you cannot breathe anymore, which is the next step in that pneumonia they have and in the acute respiratory failure, then your oxygen goes down and your carbon dioxide shoots up. That triggers a change in your blood. It makes it acidotic, sour. And in that acidotic, milieu, calcium is set free from its protein bonds and calcium is the most important trigger of the blood coagulation cascade. So you have the inflammation on the one hand and you have the calcium and acidosis on the other hand and that causes, causes thrombosis and it's, it's found that uh, a lot of the people actually die of the microthrombs that are being built up in their blood and they are going to the lung and in all the organs. But especially of course if your lungs are blocked by microsomes, you can't breathe anymore. I mean, oxygen is not going in and out. So it's really about avoiding that microembolization. And it's known in the hospitals, they're giving heparin for that reason. It's, it's not my theory. It's a known fact that embolization is a major problem in COVID-19. And um, all the people, diabetic, hypertensive people, much more easily get into that uh, condition I just described. So uh, again, can dairy you, can products. You explain, can you explain what heparin is? I mean, I know it's a blood. Heparin is an anticoagulant. Yeah. And that's a general, very important treatment in COVID-19 that nobody mentions because it's not a cool drug you can make money from. But it's a basis treatment that good hospitals give their COVID-19 peer patients. Anticoagulation, it's first and most important step. You, you probably heard that a lot of the people on the ventilators die. So the ventilators are not the solution because it's a general disease. Um, there are tests that putting the people on their belly so can, that they can breathe on their belly is uh, maybe as good or better than ventilators. So if you have an earlier stage, lie on your, no, on your belly and you open up your lung and you can breathe better again. You find a lot of uh, uh, emergency doctors talking about that on YouTube. It's a standard procedure that's helpful. Mm. So, so just like, again, to connect the diet with the coagulation. So if you have, just for in layman's terms, if you have more coagulation, you get more clots, that gives you embolisms. Yeah. Embolisms, you know, just correct me if I'm wrong, because I'm not a doctor, which are uh, these are microembolisms, which you described, which are exactly. blocks in different arteries, correct? Which yeah. Different parts of your body, including your heart and parts of the brain from receiving oxygen. Am I correct? Yeah. Lung, heart, kidneys, multi-organ failure, which is often seen in COVID-19 patients. Uh, that's why there's multi-organ failure, which doesn't make any sense normally. Or why should a pneumonia cause multi-organ failure, which means that all organs or many of them, like the kidneys, all fail at the same time. So that's why one thing doesn't really help. It's, uh, it's really very, how serious COVID-19 hits you basically really depends on your general state of health. 
if you're generally healthy, you have usually a good outcome. And if not, you can have a really problematic outcome. Um, problem is a lot of people think they're healthy whilst they're on five different drugs and have you know, seven different diseases. So people are really not aware how sick they actually are. Uh, let's put it that way, a lot of our uh, senior people are kept alive by medication. So, and uh, it's showing that that's definitely um, prolonging life, but not a healthy life. And that's what's happening now. Can you, can you address vitamin D in the diet and how important that is? W vitamin D you don't get in the diet. Uh, you, you make it in your skin. Yeah. Um, when you expose it to the sun, you need UVB light for that, uh, which you don't get in the northern hemispheres and uh, most of the time. You also got it, don't get it inside. Uh, vitamin D, black people can't make it at all here, basically. And the darker your skin, really, it goes down dramatically what you make. Therefore, you get a lot of wrong information. You, you just go out for like 15 minutes and you have enough vitamin D. That's basically complete nonsense because it entirely depends on the color of your skin, how much vitamin D you're going to make. Um, vitamin D has been the general uh, World Health Organization recommendation for all respiratory disease. It's interesting that you don't hear about it at all from the World Health uh, Organization except on their webpage. There is really tons and tons of evidence, large studies that show that you dramatically reduce your risk of influenza by uh, supplementing vitamin D, of um, pneumonia and of other respiratory disease, and ultimately COVID-19 is a respiratory disease. So if you have a lack of vitamin D and you supplement vitamin D, you reduce your risk of a respiratory disease like COVID-19 or influenza by amazing 70%. That's a very huge number. Um, by now, quite some studies have come out that are directly linking vitamin D with COVID-19. Um, the, the most intriguing study is from Asia, where, you, uh, where it's shown that those people who have really normal vitamin D levels that means above 75 nanomoles per liter, have a 20 times higher probability for mild disease than the other ones. So your chances of survival are 20 times higher. And those who have a, a lack or subnormal or deficient vitamin D levels, their risk for a, a serious and critical outcome really goes through the roof. It's basically depending on the vitamin D level 10 to 20 times higher. So vitamin D is certainly the, the cheapest and most simple way to ameliorate your risk of a serious COVID-19 disease. Hmm. So you can take supplements for vitamin D or get You have to take supplements, yeah. Um, for elder people, the general recommendation, most younger people also need that amount, but the American Geriatric Society recommends 4,000 units daily for everybody above 70. That's also what we can see what really most people need during the year. If you have fair skin and go out in the sun during, on these days, you don't need to supplement vitamin D. But if you're an office worker, you have the same problem in the summer like in the winter. Office workers or factory workers have the same vitamin D deficiency in the summer and in the winter. Hmm. That's very interesting. Actually, there, there have been some studies in the United States that those people with darker skin have higher morbidity uh, from the That's, COVID-19 uh, disease. Yeah. Um, in the US, it's around three times higher mortality. And in Britain, the mortality is even four times three point higher for uh, black people compared to Caucasian people. That's really incredibly high. And it's not that these um, 
Afro-Americans in England are all socially poor and not treated in the same way, like in America. I mean, you have a social problem and in England, everybody's equally treated uh, equally bad. <laughs> and there's no black and white, you know, the system no is equally lousy. Equally, they have no sun in England. The sun yeah, never rises. Equally no sun, equally bad health service. It's, uh, it's a very good country. <laughs> so, all right. Uh, so you have dietary recommendations and supplement recommendations. Well, in, in, in dietary, one thing I would like to add, it's definitely vitamin C and zinc. Hmm. Now get around 500 to 1000 milligram of vitamin C and get 10 to 20 milligrams of zinc. Both are definitely helpful for strengthening immunity, especially against viral any viral disease that's known for a long time. And there have been really good successes with vitamin C infusions and COVID-19 cases also, like IV vitamin C, high dose. In Germany, this has been used for a very long time. It has a direct antiviral effect and uh, it's been used in, in hospitals in China and I heard in America also. All right. Uh, yeah, one question I have is uh, sometimes you find different people from India, you know, coming up with all these like really weird types of recommendations for COVID-19. Uh, what, what would you recommend as far as that's concerned? Concern, uh, uh, considering that you're, you know, scientifically involved and you want to look at hmm. Uh, studies, you know, different scientific studies, controlled studies? Well, this is a very difficult question because obviously also in medicine, a lot depends on faith. So uh, there are charismatic healers also amongst devotees who have that power to generate a lot of faith in their followers and faith is a great healing force but not with a deadly disease so if you're pretty healthy and you're faithful then everything will go away you'll be fine but if you have all risk factors and you're really sick faith may not be enough so you always have to have that balance between common sense and 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 faith and that's usually lacking with this is not well trained in devotee communities, not tra trained at all actually worldwide. We, we see that more and more people are, are losing any common sense. Science is getting more and more unscientific. It's just really fulfilling corporate needs. Uh, practically most scientists are basically employed by the pharmaceutical industry. So to get really objective information has become a really very hard thing. It's all colored by different interests. Hmm. So um, use common sense and don't follow blindly. You can follow blindly if you're well, you know, then doesn't matter really, but <laughs> start, start doubting in time before you're dead. So, so you don't think we should be drinking bleach or anything like that to overcome uh, these diseases? Well, <laughs> depends on the kind of bleach I mean, and the dosage. <laughs> if you dilute it homeopathically, it may work if you have faith, but you shouldn't take it in a higher concentration. <laughs> <laughs> Not a good idea. All right, uh, do you want to take some questions? I mean, Trump, Trump is an interesting example of somebody who's always mixing, you know, uh, truth with conspiracy and so on. And, and that's the new normal, actually, I would say everywhere. So it's become very hard to really uh, find the truth in the present moment anywhere. Interesting. Do you want to take some questions from people now? Yeah. Uh, let me see if I have anything important to mention. Yeah. Keep in mind, it's the aerosols. Again, that's really the main method. Aerosols are these little droplets coming out of your lung. If you talk or sing, that's the way other people can get infected or you get infected. That's why if there's no ventilation, closed rooms, a lot of people, that's the problem. Like uh, when COVID-19 started, I went into a cafe to, to pee and 
there were 50 old ladies sitting and, and chatting in that small cafe. That was like, how can you be so stupid? All risk factors, perfect place to spread. But people are stupid and that's why we have the problem. If you act in a sane way, it's not really dangerous. Avoid the hotspots. Can, in that light, can I share the uh, chart with everybody that you actually sent me this morning? Here. Yeah, it's a good chart, I think, yeah. You can see the chart? Can you see it, Radharaja, on your screen? Yeah, I can see. So in other words, this is the re reducing the risk of coronavirus transmission. As Radharaja said, you know, better to stay home with your family or you walk, run, bike, outdoors with other people. A little more risky is group gatherings outdoors and extremely risky is group gathering indoors, which Radharaja, Dr. Radharaja stated, that's the way, especially if they're chanting the holy names <laughs> and there's- Inside, not outside. Do it, just, just go on Harinam. But not in, no Harinam inside, no Kirtan inside because- <laughs> Yeah, Harinam, Harinam is the solution for the problem. Also, I mean, with the social distancing, Harinam, you can go through a whole town, you know, just imagine two meters apart, that chain, you cover the whole city. <laughs> so also every time you say the word Krishna, a whole bunch, you know, because it's, it's an it's this explosive type of statement, Krishna, it comes right out of your mouth and goes like 200 meters. No, 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 no. it doesn't go 200 meters. No. <laughs> How many meters does it go? Well, we, uh, it's not been tested for the word Krishna specifically. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> it really depends on your pronunciation, you know, how moist it is. <laughs> but, you know, if you, uh, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, you're fine. Just make a, a surgical Harinam and everything is okay because the aerosols get dropped here. <laughs> Maybe you should get that in saffron. I mean, <laughs> Also, we demonstrate that we are socially responsible. It's a what lot better than becoming known as the next super spreading cult, <laughs> like in South Korea. But your, your glasses just got fogged up when you put your mask on. I know, that's the problem. <laughs> you, I need a dog to lead me in Harinam. <laughs> so, do you want to take some questions now? Yeah, sure. Okay, let me unblock people. Give me one second so I can allow people to ask questions. Wait a second. Um, do, 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 do. Oh, it's been... Okay, so whoever wants to ask a question, you can unmute yourself now. Anybody want to ask a question to the doctor? Hi, Krishna. Oh, that's... Okay, Lee the Shakti. Hi, Krishna. Um, actually, um, I just wanted to really thank you so much. I'm really grateful because that's, it's like all the things that I've been reading over the last couple of months, just sort of concisely down into a very articulated uh, monologue. So it was really good. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, okay, Roger, Roger, uh Okay, I just took you off mute. What did you say, Roger? Roger? Yeah, um, we, I really had to look into it uh, quite early. We have 45 people and if we get shut down, it would have been, a, nobody got sick in our company. So um, you can, uh, you by common sense, you can avoid really a lot of things. Thank you for, um, for your appreciation <laughs> and stay well. <laughs> All right, anyone else want to ask a question before I ask my final question? Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna Gurudev. This is Hare Guru. Oh, good. Good to hear from you. So, you have a question for me? Um, uh, yes, yes, uh, yes, Maharaj. Um, so, uh, it was a good uh, introduction, um, Prabhu. Um, just wanted to ask you follow up on uh, um, there's a bit of this mystery um, syndrome in kids with the COVID 19. Um, um, so could you just elaborate on that? Are they being um, as a um, huge uh, carriers of the infection or it is just uh, has to be proven it? Well, of course, kids are a major carrier of the infection. That's logical because they don't get very sick and they get around. And you know, if, practically in our company, only mothers 
get sick all the time because the kids infect them. That's the same here. But you cannot hold a whole society in shutting down everything. You have to isolate the ones at risk and let uh, the normal ones go on with their life. So the, the, shut, the lockdown should have been for those above 70 and with risk factors and not for the kids. If they get infected, that's okay. If their parents get infected, uh, most people will get infected. If you look at the studies in, in a lot of the countries, it's already 5 to 7% who are and who got infected. So, so, so we, do, uh, we, do, we, Radha Raja, we do find some of the kids yeah. getting sick. Is, is that due to the coagulation factor? Well, that's just normal. Kids get sick uh, and they also get sick from COVID-19. And uh, it's, if they have a good, Im just one second. If they, have, if they have a good immune system, it will be less severe, but uh, kids get sick. If kid gets influenza or, or, or some cold, they can get also really seriously sick. It is per year 2.5 million people who die of respiratory diseases. 2.4 million. So we have now 350,000 COVID-19 deaths. It's like death is part of life and disease is part of life. And you have to see it in correlation to the real numbers and find, uh, find the, the reasonable middle way. Because as I said, it's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's going to stick around. You cannot just shut down life for the next two years. The shutdown for the kids, the, the violence at home, that whole madness, that is so much worse than a few yes. more deaths that could have been caused in, in, uh, in the older population. And that's tragic, but it's a difference if like young people get really damaged and if somebody who dies now at the age of 85 instead of 87. And the average death rate in Italy was 80. So it's, it's, not, it's not that healthy young people usually die of this problem, really. If you look at the numbers, if you look at the media, you find always these singled out stories, a mother got COVID-19 and blah, blah, blah. But these are solitary cases blown up by media really um, centered on creating panic. The, the, the lack of common sense in the media and the amount of fear mongering is staggering. Uh, nobody writes about hypertension. 10.4 million people die of hypertension every year. 10.4 million. Smoking, 7.1 million. It's not, no, lock down all the smokers. You would save more lives. A lot more lives. <laughs> so politically, I mean, psychologically it makes sense because it's, I mean, it's a lot of money at stake here for, for a lot of people. But in terms of real health benefits or social benefits, the whole thing doesn't make sense at all. And yes, kids get sick. They're going to infect the parents. You have to make sure that you have vulnerable elder people that you and they wear face masks when visiting. That's the most critical part, really, the elder people. But again, if I read quite some stories. Now the eldest French lady, 110 years, survived covid 19 very well i think the eldest spanish or mexican lady same thing it's like it's not that all older people die even some of the eldest just passed it hmm. all right anybody else want to ask a question before i ask my final question hey, okay you know well okay why don't you no, ask uh, Hare Krishna. So, uh, Doctor, uh, I just want to ask you, as you mentioned, that the vitamin D is very much important, and especially those who are uh, like like light colored, they can actually get absorbed from the sunlight, right? Yeah, you can't uh, exactly. Mm -hmm. So, I just wanted to ask that uh, how much uh, the unit we should uh, like see for uh, like because of the medicine, I have to take the supplement. And yeah, how, how um, with with your skin, I would definitely take four thousand unit per day you're pretty dark skinned and your own vitamin D synthesis is low. Like the darker the skin, the less really it drops down dramatically. So 4,000 units also in the summer makes sense. Oh, okay, doctor. okay, doctor. But you could also get a, a blood test sometimes. Then you see where your levels is like you supplement. And if you haven't taken any uh, supplementation so far, like for, ten, for like three weeks, you can also take 10,000 units. 
okay. to okay. get up the the levels or any, Only, any specific uh, brand doctor like if you recommend any specific brand or something well, um, in your countries i don't know reliable brands but vitamin d is cheap therefore there's not much cheating really it's only with expensive stuff that cheating is going on. Do you, uh, doctor, uh, let me just ask you a question about vitamin D. Do you recommend the liquid in oil vitamin D? Oh, uh, yeah, that's a, very, that's a very good point. Tablets are pretty useless because they just go through. Uh, vitamin D is a fatty, fat-soluble vitamin, therefore it should be taken or must be taken in oil. And then you can just drop it in your mouth and it gets absorbed already there. But it should be oil based, not tablet based. Okay. Thank That's you. really important point. Mm -hmm. And uh, blood tests for vitamin D do make sense, and also um, B12 for devotees, especially if they're a little older, is a must blood test once a year. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, good question. Anybody else want to ask a question? Oh, we got, uh, okay. One more question. Yeah. So I've, I think I've read or heard in the past that to actually be able to absorb um, vitamin C and zinc efficiently, that, you know, optimally, that that also needs to have a reasonable amount, you must have reasonable amounts of vitamin D already. Is that true? I, I hadn't, uh, the, the sound quality is really low. You need enough vitamin C and zinc to absorb the D? No, you know, she needs D. She's asking if she needs D to absorb C, uh, C and zinc. Most no. Effectively. Okay. no, not really, but you need magnesium for the vitamin D. And it's good to add K2 if you're a little older because the K2 also is important for the hypercoagulation thing, vitamin okay. K2. But the C and zinc take care of a different aspect, really. The magnesium, the minerals, some calcium is good, but not too much, obviously, you know, like not in dairy form. Magnesium and uh, K2 that go with the, um, the D3. And D3 is better than uh, D2. Are, are there also some um, food-based sources for for absorbing calcium, I think I've, I've seen molasses and uh, you know leafy for, greens. For calcium, uh, you, for calcium, it's very high in sesame seeds. Hmm. Sesame seeds. And generally, nuts are pretty rich in calcium and also have other health benefits. And if you really eat uh, lots of vegetables, they are really rich in calcium, actually, and rich in magnesium. So. Um, they're a, good, a better source of calcium because it's calcium citrate, alkaline calcium, whilst the calcium in milk is calcium phosphate. And the calcium phosphate is the problematic one. That's why people who lead a lot of dairy don't get uh, milk products, don't get less osteoporosis, but often more. But also don't eat too little protein, or get, get pulses, dal, and have a balanced, reasonable diet. Don't go crazy in any extreme. Okay. Anybody else want to ask a question? Yeah, Mark has a question. Tell me, okay. Yes. yes, doctor. So when you said sesame seeds is rich in calcium, um, is it white sesame seeds or black sesame seeds? I guess both. I mean, uh, they absorb it equally. Both should be fine. Okay. Thank you. Like tahin and stuff like that. Now, especially for kids, it's great food. It's nutritious if you have growing kids, tofu, sesame seeds that are all really good sources. Tofu. <laughs> well, yeah, the Asians are a lot healthier than the Indians, obviously. The Indians are world master in cardiovascular mortality, <laughs> which is a big achievement being vegetarian. So we need to look to China and Asia and Thailand for healthy diets. The Indians didn't invent it, really, <laughs> but they invented very tasty food, obviously. Okay, so, so I, I, let, let me finish up by asking you a question about something that may be controversial. So, uh, you hinted in the whole discussion about uh, milk products and taking too much milk products and how it would increase the coagulation and everything like that. So, uh, what do you recommend 
as far as milk products, is there a maximum one should take? I know we talked about this in a previous discussion every day. Yeah, it's, a, it's a good point no, because everything is really a matter of amount. Yeah. Um, you can see the longest living people on the planet now are the uh, Adventists um, in uh, California. And uh, the largest now, the, those, the vegans amongst them, but also the vegetarians amongst them do very well and do a lot better than the meat eating ones who also eat a pretty healthy diet actually, because all the Adventists eat healthily. It's part of their religion actually. So if you look at the vegetarian Adventists, you see a striking difference to the, uh, to the other vegetarians worldwide, which do really pretty bad in recent studies. If you look at England or everywhere, vegetarians and also vegans are not doing so well because they don't eat healthy diets. The vegetarian Adventists took an average of 150 milliliters of milk. So that's all included, you know, cheese, everything as an equivalent of 150 milliliters. Most devotees are more at one liter with all the paneer and shrikhand and everything and the sweets, you easily come to a liter of milk. So this is really a completely crazy amount that is only sustainable by industrial agriculture and by killing calves and, and uh, we are supporting really an immense amount of cruelty and are destroying our own health. Hmm. Which is like a clear karmic correlation, I would say. Um, whilst these 100, 150 milliliters of milk, this you can get from an Ahingsa kind of cow tending, but not really more. If you look at all the Ahingsa projects, how much milk they do, you know, that's pretty the max you can get for a community. And in that way, it's certainly not harmful and maybe a little beneficial. But this one liter of milk is clearly problematic. I mean, you, you feel it right away if you take big amounts of milk, you know, you become slimy and everything. Your system gets clustered up and the same happens to your blood. You get all, a lot of more of autoimmune reactions and so on, you know, it's directly connected to diabetes type one, um, to prostate cancer, to ovary cancer. There's a lot of evidence that's linking now uh, milk products to a lot of uh, health issues. But of course, I mean, in terms of Western diets, there's things that are worse. Uh, meat is worse and sausages and burgers are even worse. So most people in the West really eat a terrible diet. Can you, can you explain what 150 milliliters means in terms oh. of cups? Oh, yeah. It, it's, it's a small cup. and It's not a big cup. It's a really a small cup. Like a teacup. Yeah, exactly. It's a teacup. And, and we had, in our previous interview, we talked about that was Prabhupada's recommendation as a maximum. Yeah. So it's, yeah. You know, I just wanted to make sure the devotees understand that point that Prabhupada said maximum one cup of milk or equivalent. And the equivalent of one cup of milk in paneer is probably a little piece of paneer about this small, right? Yeah, it's probably one to 10 or one, one to seven. Yeah. But um, it's all a matter of amount. And in our Western civilization, you, we completely lost the balance in that. In India, the same. Now that's why every Brahmin uh, has a belly that goes out like uh, one meter. I mean, social distancing there is not a problem. Yeah, it looks like they're pregnant. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> has advantages now. <laughs> oh, it, it, it didn't used to be like that. You know, if you look at, if you hear the Rupa Goswami and the stories of the old sadhus, like walking 40 kilometers a day, I mean, they used to be really um, different. It's not the uh, normal Vedic way to be obese. Mm -hmm. It's the normal Western way. And it's cruel to ourselves and to other living entities in a, in a terrible way, obviously. Wow. All right. 
thank you very much, uh, Dr. Radharaja, for your enlightening talk. And uh, thank you very much. I really appreciate taking the time out of your busy day. And uh, Good you know, um, I wish we were all in Germany. We could all order your products, and we could turn this into an advertisement. But we're not. We're in good order. <laughs> No, yeah, no, you, you find what you need where, wherever you are and uh, stay well. Thank you for the opportunity to serve you in that way. And now it's going to be over. Be careful starting in November, really, then it's going to become critical again. No. It's like in, in Spain, everybody was really partying when COVID-19 started and everybody got sick. You know, they had like three weeks of carnival and demonstrations. And then they shut down the entire country. Nobody could leave the, the door anymore. So going from one extreme to the other, this is what we need to avoid by common sense. Starting especially next November when the next wave comes. Okay. Thank you very much. All glorious to Srila Prabhupada. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was his wife, Sita Sundari, who just waved at us. All right. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.